Hey guys, and welcome to episode four of Optometry Spark Notes. If you haven't already, go ahead and click the like and subscribe button below to stay up to date with the most current optometric standard of care. And today we're gonna go ahead and tackle a pretty big topic, herpes simplex and herpes zoster. We're gonna start with herpes simplex. And guys, as we know, HSV1 usually happens above the belt and HSV2 is mainly below the belt. So HSV1 will focus on, and as we know, mainly affects the eyes, the mouth, and or the respiratory tract. Um, and is usually transmitted by pretty close contact with mucous membranes, saliva, and external skin. And guys, 90% of people acquire this as a child, and then the virus from the trigeminal ganglion is re-triggered by stress, sun, hormones, trauma, and or immunosuppression. So guys, let's go ahead and talk about herpes simplex signs. So the patient could have primarily blepharitis and or follicular conjunctivitis. So make sure that we look for those follicles because it's classically a virus, right? But we can also, in the epithelium, as we know, have a classic dendritic ulcer. But in addition to that, guys, we can have a geographic ulcer, which is a very wide ulcer. We can have a marginal ulcer, which is close to the limbus. We can have neurotropic keratopathy, which is a super large oval ulcer. Or simply an epithelial defect. That isn't painful, and that's due to the reduced corneal sensitivity. Um, and last but not least, we can also have corneal vesicles. So let's talk about the stroma. We can have two possibilities here. One is interstitial keratitis, which is when you have edema plus neovascularization without involvement from either the epithelium or the endothelium. And number two, we can have necrotizing keratitis, which is simply just edema without neovascularization. Both can cause thinning and potential perforation, so we want to watch out for that. And the last layer of the cornea, as we know, can cause discoform endotheliitis, which is when you have a defect in the endothelium that causes focal edema in the stroma. And guys, in rare cases, we can have infectious uveitis or retinitis with this disease. Now overall, I've seen one case of herpes simplex before in school, and I learned from an ophthalmologist who said, if you see a red eye that doesn't fall into any other category that you've seen before or don't recognize, it's likely herpes simplex, and I try to keep remembering that. So guys, how do we treat this disease? Well, as we know, oral medication is going to be the best. We can give the patient 400 milligrams of acyclovir five times a day for seven to 10 days, or we can give the patient 500 milligrams of valacyclovir three times a day for seven to 10 days. If there's epithelial involvement, we can give the patient gain cyclovir, which is Zurigan gel, or trifluridine, which is viroptic. If there's stromal edema involved, we can optionally give the patient a steroid drop. And last but not least, if there's uveitis, we also wanna treat that as well. And guys, the follow-up period is really going to depend on the signs and symptoms. There's not a one-size-fits-all for this. But in the acute phase, we want to see the patient pretty closely until that resolution. And then as things kind of settle down and the patient's feeling better, we can taper off those follow-ups. So let's talk about the maintenance dosage that you can give to your patient if you do decide to prescribe this. The HEADS-2 study confirmed that 400 milligrams of acyclovir twice a day can prevent the recurrence of any form of herpes by 41% and can prevent the recurrence of stromal keratitis by 50%, but there is no prevention of epithelial disease to convert to stromal disease if the patient is on the medication. So guys, I actually have two experiences with prescribing the maintenance dosage for patients, and one was a white female in her early 30s, and the other one was an African-American male in his early 70s, and they both had this residual opacification or scarring in the stroma, both of which were not complaining when they came in for their routine exam. Um, but I noticed that it had been described and diagnosed in the history, so I just wanted to experiment with the maintenance dosage. When I saw the white female back for her follow-up, she said that she felt better overall, but her vision had not been changed or affected with or without the medication. And then the African-American male said that he actually was able to see a little bit better because his opacification was right through his visual axis. But when I looked at his eye through the slit lamp, there was no resolution of that opacification. So it could just be, you know, a, um, a placebo effect. But I think prescribing the maintenance dosage would really depend 
on the patient's symptoms, comfort, and their vision overall. So guys, let's talk about herpes zoster virus. 95% of us have the precursor virus called varicella zoster virus by the age of five, and that's called chicken pox. Then the virus lays dormant in the trigeminal ganglion and or other sensory ganglia. Then when activation occurs, that's when it's called herpes zoster virus. If, it's, uh, if the virus is activated from the trigeminal ganglion, then it's called herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So this is almost always diagnosed clinically and only presents on one side of the body by dermatome. And along any part of the dermatome can you have the development of signs or symptoms. Usually it starts as a grouped um, collection of vesicles, then turns into pustules, and then ends up as a crust. After about seven to 10 days from that initial onset, the patient's no longer contagious in most cases. And then if we recognize a patient that has a rash, then we wanna go ahead and treat them within 72 hours for the best efficacy. So let's talk about common signs. So as we know, Hutchinson sign, which is involvement in the tip of the nose, will increase the risk of ocular involvement. And the most common ocular signs are PEK, pseudodendrites, anterior stromal keratitis, and also neurotrophic keratitis. The less common signs are exposure keratopathy, discoform keratitis, interstitial keratitis, uveitis, cranial nerve palsies, really anything because this virus can affect any part of the eye. So we have to be really vigilant that any ocular structure might be involved. So guys, I actually have two experiences with this virus also. Um, the first one was when I was a student on rotation. It was a white male in his early 70s that presented with the classic rash and vesicle formation. And the other one was actually a white female in her mid-30s with the same involvement. And for young patients like that, you mainly want to send them back to their primary care doctor to see if they're immunocompromised and to see if there's anything systemically going on. But when you see something you know, like this in clinic, most of the time it'll be pretty obvious because they'll have facial involvement, maybe even before any ocular involvement. So treatment for this, as we know, is going to be double the dosage of herpes simplex, and that's 800 milligrams of acyclovir five times a day for seven to 10 days, or valacyclovir one gram three times a day for seven to 10 days. We can think about using an antibiotic or an acyclovir ointment for the skin lesions and treat secondary complications as needed. And we also want to go ahead and probably inform the patient about post-herpetic neuralgia possibilities and manage the pain accordingly if that does happen. So guys, that's everything. I know it's a lot to unfold, but it's just a good quick summary of the herpes simplex and herpes zoster viruses. Again, go ahead and leave a question, comment. Go ahead and like and subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you next time.